Doctors, please be seated. <laughs> Members of the graduating class, your parents, other relatives, faculty, and friends. I want to welcome all of you to this happy occasion, and I want to extend my particular congratulations to those of you who are graduating today. We have now come to the place in our commencement program where I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker of the morning. Dr. Marvin Anderson is Dean of University Extension and Director of Cooperative Extension Service in Agriculture and Home Economics here at Iowa State University. He assumed his present duties in March 1966 and has been a member of the university staff since 1939. Born at Stanhope, Iowa, he received the BS degree in agronomy from Iowa State in 1939, the MS degree in soil management in 1949, and the PhD in agricultural economics and soil management in 1955, also from Iowa State. In 1939-1940, he was County 4-H agent in Wayne County, and from 1940 to 42, he was District Soils agent at Creston. He joined the central staff of the Extension Service as Extension Agronomist in 1942, but from May 1944 to March 1946, he served with the United States Navy, attaining the rank of Lieutenant. In 1952, he was appointed to the position of Associate Director of Cooperative Extension Service. As Dean of University Extension, Dr. Anderson administers the extension programs of Iowa State University. These include the Engineering Extension Service and the Center for Industrial Research and Service, as well as the Cooperative Extension Service. He also administers the University Office of Extension Courses and Conferences. Dr. Anderson has served with distinction on several technical foreign assignments. He spent from January to April of 1959 in New Delhi, India, working with a team of agricultural specialists to shape a nationwide program for increasing agricultural production. The project was under the sponsorship of the Ford Foundation. In 1963, Dr. Anderson was awarded the Superior Service Award of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He is a member of Alpha Zeta, Gamma Sigma Delta, Sigma Psi, and Phi Kappa Phi Honorary Societies, and the Soil Conservation Society of America, the Adult Education Association of America, and Epsilon Sigma Phi. In 1966, he was given the State Farm Safety Leadership Award. In November 1967, Dr. Anderson was appointed as a consultant to participate as a member of a group of Ford Foundation's consultants on Indian agriculture. As a part of this assignment, he spent the months of January 1969 in India, observing research and extension activities at the agricultural universities and at various levels of India's governmental structure in order to make recommendations to the Ford Foundation on programs to aid in increasing India's agricultural production. Dr. Anderson has decided to take early retirement next July 1 from his present position here at Iowa State. Although I can appreciate his reasons for wanting to do so, I am nonetheless unhappy about losing him because I have come to know Marvin Anderson not only as a distinguished colleague, but as a good personal friend. And it is my genuine pleasure to introduce to you now Dean Marvin Anderson, who will speak to you on the subject Education by Design. Dr. Anderson. President Parks, thanks very much for that very generous introduction. Faculty of Iowa State University, the graduates, family, and friends of the graduates. I do want to add my congratulations to all the graduates here today for their significant accomplishment, which is represented by this ceremony today. I know the President, as he's already spoken, and all faculty and staff want to wish you well 
as each of you seek new goals and new levels of attainment in the years ahead. For you who are graduating today, today's recognition culminates 16 to 20 or more years of an educational experience and an effort on your part. But I'd quickly add there are others, too, who have shared in this effort through encouragement or patience and sacrifice. And of course, I'm referring to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, spouses, and children. And I think they deserve recognition, too. And I'm going to ask all the family members of the graduates to stand at this time, and then ask the graduates to respond to that group. Won't you stand, all the family members, please? During the last several years, there has been considerable dialogue regarding the changing needs of higher education, a dialogue that has moved from the problem of how to deal with expanding, even burgeoning enrollments, to a steady state or even declining enrollments, and also a dialogue among students and educators regarding the adequacy of educational programs offered for our changing society. In my remarks this morning, I'd like to talk to you about the changing character of education and educational institutions in this country. I'll do this under three subtopics. One, to assert that education is a high-value product. And secondly, institutional response to social needs. And third, designing education for tomorrow's needs. Our culture, our society, has always placed a very high value on education. This is evident from the earliest pronouncement of this country's leaderships and political actions. For example, the Northwest Ordinance, Ordinance of 1787 provided a plan for government of this country northwest of the Ohio River. And one pronouncement regarding education was as follows. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary for good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means for education shall forever be encouraged. And President Abraham Lincoln, by his many actions, emphasized the importance of education and said, upon the subject of education, not presuming to dictate any plan or system respecting it, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. And this high value concept of education continues today and causes parents to wish for their son or daughter greater educational opportunities than they had. Why is this true? Well, very briefly, education has been shown to be the means for an improved level of living, and education is the means towards greater self-fulfillment and satisfaction. But the opportunities for educational experiences for the masses of people has not always been as today. In President Lincoln's time, educational institutions in this country served only a small minority, a select group of the socially elite and wealthy. Studies at higher education institutions were centered in the so-called learned professions of theology, law, and medicine. And education of that day was both authoritarian and finite. Authoritarian because it was founded in the doctrine of theology, philosophy, law, and medicine, and finite because it was the distillate of the total knowledge of a rather static society which produced little new knowledge. And so, a student after five or more years of advanced education was certified as a master by his teacher, and the student could confidently go out and practice his profession with assurance that he had learned everything there was to know and that nothing new would be added in his lifetime. This was the background from which evolved a new and dramatic shift in the focus of American higher education, and specifically led to the creation of the land-grant university system, Iowa State University being one of those institutions. And this began a new era in which there was 
institutional response to social needs. The Morrill Act of 1862, signed by Abraham Lincoln, provided for education for men and women from all walks of life, not just for the well-to-do or the intellectual elite, but for all, who in the developer's language, and I quote, must carry the burdens for citizenship and productive service in a great and growing nation, end quote. The curriculum of this new institution, in addition to the classics, offered training in agriculture, mechanic arts, domestic science, veterinary medicine, and so on. This curriculum was, substantially, was a substantial departure from that of the learned professions of the earlier period and served to provide trained persons to serve the needs of the time. Later, two additional functions were added to the mission of the land-grant university. They were research and extension. Federal funding for research under the Hatch Act of 1887 and for extension under the Smith-Lever Act of 1914 provided a dual effort that played a very substantial role in the technological revolution in agriculture in the United States to, ben to the benefit of both farmers and consumers of food. Indeed, the research and extension functions provided the means for the land-grant institutions to contribute to social needs in a very direct and a very effective way. Iowa was an early national leader in extension work. In 1870, the then President Welch, of Iowa, President of the Iowa State University, initiated farmers' institutes in various parts of the state, while his wife Mary conducted home economics programs for homemakers. In 1903, P.G. Holden, then head of agronomy at this institution, conducted a meeting in Hull, Iowa, where the suggestion was offered by a participant in, by saying, we have a county superintendent of schools, why don't we have a county superintendent of agriculture? In 1906, the legislature provided for an agricultural extension department at this university. And in 1913, the legislature created engineering extension. That unit served the educational and technical needs of a growing manufacturing and industrial state. These two units, the Cooperative Extension Service and Engineering Extension, were created to provide useful, practical, problem-solving educational information to persons not resident at the university, and especially to those who, for reasons, were not able to attend college. And today, under the organization of University Extension, these units, together with the Office of Extension Courses and Conferences and the Center for Industrial Research and Service, serve thousands of youth and adults, families and communities, and businesses and industries in all parts of the state. In addition, the off-campus educational programs each year, over 30,000 persons participate in non-credit short courses, conferences, and institutes. The campus of the university is indeed the boundaries of the state and beyond. This educational institution and system is today characterized as the most unique system of scientific, technical, and practical education the world has ever known. As a consequence of this, many faculty from this institution and others have been invited to foreign countries to assist in the development of similar systems in, that, in their own countries. And so, as we have seen the development of the land-grant institutions providing for undergraduate and graduate training, research and extension services, so have we seen changes in the demands for different types of educational services. These changing demands relate to the changing character of our society, the fantastic growth of new knowledge, and the resultant change in demands for educational services. So now let's look at the challenge of designing education for tomorrow's needs. We talked about the education system in, in the early 1800s, designed for small numbers of people, the elite, the wealthy, with studies confined to principally the learned professions. The second era, of higher education represented by the land-grant system, open educational opportunities for masses of people, both on the campus and to those off campus who could not come to the university for training. We've now entered another era, when students have questioned the relevance of their curriculum and have called for new courses and new approaches to the education, to education and educational systems. College graduates, especially in the professions, seek ways of continuing their educational needs. 
There are two questions that I'd like to speak to briefly. The first relates to the non-traditional degree program, and the other deals with the expanding need for continuing education. Can we establish a higher educational system to reach the segment of, pop of a population not now reached for persons who desire education, but for a number of personal reasons are not able to avail themselves of the present higher education opportunities? And secondly, how can we meet the growing demand for programs of continuing education? Even though Iowa State University and the land-grant universities around the country have made a beginning to the response to these two questions, more definitive answers will be required. During the last few years, much has been written about the non-traditional degree programs in higher education. This literature suggests that the time has arrived for unprecedented changes in higher education. Among the reports focusing on this question are the Carnegie Commission Report on Higher Education, the Newman Report, and this last year, a report of the Commission of the Non-Traditional Study Degree, Diversity by Design. The California Legislature has a study entitled Master Plan for Higher Education, and rejects, which rejects the notion that their present institutions can serve that state's needs and proposes that a fourth public segment institution system be established and entitled the California Cooperative University. The University of Nebraska has launched a pilot project funded from foundation and federal grants called SUN, S-U-N, obviously the State University of Nebraska, which would make use of statewide instructional television and with video and audio cassettes playing an important role for students who could be enrolled in non-traditional degree programs in all parts of the state. You may have read recently the story in the Des Moines Register that a study is being planned to determine the feasibility of a non-traditional degree program in Iowa. This study will be carried out on behalf of the private colleges, the Board of Regents institutions, and the area community colleges. Hopefully, the results of this will provide guidelines for our future response in this state. Now a few thoughts about the need for continuing education. The obsolescence of knowledge and the rapid rate of growth of new knowledge, the shifts in national priorities, the complexities of societal problems, and the close relationship between the application of knowledge and social progress leads to the conclusion that lifelong learning is not only desirable, but is necessary. Stanley Moses of Syracuse University estimates that by 1975, and that's just a short time off, more than 80 million adults will be counted in a, quote, learning force outside the traditional educational programs. Indeed, this is a vast audience. Iowa State, through its experience and attention by the several extension units, has been for years committed to a response to this type of educational need. The Scheman Continuing Education Building, now under construction just a short distance from this Coliseum, will provide an additional and much needed facility to contribute to lifelong learning. There is another dimension in continuing education and that grows out of the expression and interests of people like you, you the graduates of Iowa State University 1974. You've had an excellent training in one of the finest educational institutions in our country. You have, I'm sure, already experienced obsolescence in knowledge, perhaps as a freshman, the uh, facts that were taught at that time have now been outdated this year. I'm not sure what your education half-life is. This half-life is probably different in different disciplines or professions, but it has been said that the education half-life of the engineering graduate of today is less than 10 years. By this we mean that one half of what he has learned will be obsolete in a decade. And more importantly, one half of what that same engineer will need to know 10 years from now is in the form of as yet undone research. In recognition of this, professional societies are now setting up criteria and standards of training 
requiring continuing education for recertification and relicensing in the professions such as engineering, veterinary medicine, and others. Legislation is being considered in our state at the present time. Some states have already passed legislation. This is another force in lifelong learning. I expect there may be some among you who have vowed that when you got that degree today that you'd never write another term paper or crack another book. But in light of what I have just said, I hope you will reject that thought. Because if you who are graduating today are to be as successful as I think you can be, you have already begun your lifelong learning processes, which I'm sure will continue throughout your life. I come back to my original thought, that education is indeed a high value product for the world of work, for quality of living, for self-fulfillment. Universities like Iowa State, I'm sure, will want to design educational programs that will continue to serve young people and adults in lifelong learning. You can be helpful by expressing your interests and your needs as you take on other assignments and tasks. I again offer you my congratulations and very, very best wishes. Thank you. First of all, uh, FAO tried to do this. They, when uh, B. R. Sen, a famous Indian uh, gentleman, was the director general, and he had the chair for two terms, uh, he founded the Freedom from Hunger campaign all over the world. And there's still about 80 or 90 countries with organizations which are agents of social change, that, that uh, private, non-government, and FAO has sponsored them in most cases. In the United States, it turned out to be the American Freedom from Hunger Foundation, uh, which uh, has in the last few years become more a youth uh, emphasis on walks than, it, than anything else. It, it really has changed quite completely. And partly because the FAO also was the first UN organizations to start the Young World Development Program as a, uh, one part of the Freedom from Hunger campaign. Uh, this, in fact, is what generated the Second World Food Conference on a personal invitation basis rather than governments meeting together. And it turned into a very wild affair with a lot of, uh, of uh, very emotional feeling people coming to it, representing the developing countries. And this is a fascinating document on what people would like and what a lot of the ills of the world are. But there wasn't a great deal of technical input, nor was there government input in agreements to doing something. Now, also, uh, the United Nations system is, is trying to be more responsive to the changes in the governments through the UNDP, which has the money. I sat in a lot of the debates of the Governing Council of the UNDP when they were working out this concept of a country-by-country -country approach, where the country would start with its own plan, even if it were as wild as possible, and their aspirations were for steel mills and things they couldn't possibly afford. But, and they'd give them a long-term lead, 
but they would try to uh, give a little stability in it and a little guidance and uh, help out. Now, there's another very important part of the United Nations system, and this is through UNCTAD and through general resolutions. Um, let's take the case of oil. I think that the founding of OPEC, the Organization of Oil Exporting Countries, which was just about a decade old, could never have come about without a series of resolutions that seemed innocuous at the time through the United Nations on the uh, something like this. This isn't the exact wording the sovereign ownership of resources. And if you go back through the records, and, and I could give you a book by a man named McDashie if you want to follow this on, on oil, a, a Lebanese, who pointed out how successively a little more was thrown into this. So the sovereign ownership of resources on oil made possible this organization of OPEC, which in turn uh, brought together the oil producing states and broke the hold of the oil companies on them. Now, this is a fascinating story. So the UN has been an agent of, agents of change in a, a lot of other ways. Now, those are only some of them. One other one I could mention is a resolution on the liberated areas, uh, particularly Mozambique and Africa, in Guinea-Bissau, which now came into FAO. The United Nations couldn't solve this problem, which is the political arm where all the political discussion should take place. So they asked uh, two years ago that the specialized agencies do what they could to help these people from starving, for example. So FAO has worked with some of these liberation groups in getting food to them against the will of their parent countries. This is a very hard thing to deal with in a technical organization, but it's a fact of the situation that's extremely <laughs> important. Constantly the, the member governments uh, who disagree, like Portugal and in this case the United States, opposed the admission of Guinea-Bissau to, to membership for the very reason that it had not broken away properly in terms from Portugal. It didn't have, uh, there didn't exist all of the usual things that the U.S. insists on before a country be recognized, and so on. It, well, it's, it's very complicated, but uh, I said early in my speech that FAO can do only what its 131 member governments want it to do. That is a constraint. But they do a lot of things that some member governments, including the, uh, the United States, don't want them to do because of the preponderance of, shall we say, African votes for, uh, on issues such as this one. Any other points? I gave, gave such a long answer to that one that it probably stopped all questions. Way at the back. Yes, ma'am. Was the increase in the production of the corn, let's say, uh, per acre in the last few years, had gone along also with the high increase in percentage of energy units needed to produce this level? With the shortages of fuel and with the shortages of food and some of the other shortages, could you just comment about some of the That's a very good question. Well, I think the whole <coughs> economic structure of the world is changing, focusing on shortages, whereas there'd been surpluses, and if not surpluses, a belief that we could always get access to everything. It's a fundamental change that we're having to face up to right now. And the, the issue in the United States is, uh, is perhaps more serious on oil, uh, and in Europe, and in Japan. In other parts of the world, I guess it's food. Uh, but there are a lot of other shortages. Cotton's short, timber's short, uh, a lot of the minerals are short. And one of the implications uh, that I think you have in mind is can food be used as a weapon as oil is being used for a weapon? This comes up so many times. Is that what you really were wanted me to get at? Well, maybe you're referring to an article in uh, Science of the 2nd of November by seven Cornell University writers, which said that it costs, for one acre of corn, it takes 80 gallons of gas. That's the cost. That's the only study I know, a current one, that's, that's very timely on, on this point. And 
It's rather frightening to think that. That inc includes, of course, the, the fuel it takes to produce the automobiles and the tractors, uh, as well as what they actually burn on the field. So it, it, it's a very pervasive uh, cost factor in terms of, uh, of, of the input. Uh, well, I think we can just say it is enormous, and as I indicated at the FAO conference, again and again, these speeches said we, we've got to have access.